Hi everyone, how is everyone doing today? My name is Fala, graduated from Boston University Biomedical Engineering Master's Program. BU's BME department was founded in 1966. The department is among the largest of its kind in the U.S. with around 100 primary and affiliated faculty in diverse research domains like biomechanics, biomaterial, imaging, computational modeling, molecular and cellular tissue engineering, neuroengineering, system and synthetic engineering, nanotechnology and sensing. Both of its undergrad and graduate programs consistently ranked among the top BME departments in the nation by U.S. News and World Report. As a grad student, I feel totally thrilled and privileged to have the opportunity to make a connection and learn from these top researchers and scientists in order to let more people get access to these incredibly valuable resources i'm collaborating with the bme gsc student organization to interview distinguished faculty in the bu bme program regarding different research domains academic career and insights for current bme undergrad grad students and international students we hope these conversations can add some value to you our first guest is professor mark grandstaff he is a distinguished professor of translational research. He is the professor of biomedical engineering, professor of chemistry, professor of material science and engineering, and professor of medicine. He is the director of NIH translational research in biomaterial training program and the director of BU Nanotechnology Innovation Center. He received his PhD from UIUC and he was a NIH postdoctoral fellow at Caltech. His award includes ACS Nobel Laureate Signature Award, NSF Career Award, and the founding fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. He is an author or co-author of 365 peer-reviewed papers with more than 34,000 citations. On top of that, he has more than 200 issued patents or pending applications. He also co-founded seven companies with several products being sold and used in the clinic. There is a saying, you can impress from a distance, but you can only impact up close. I have known Professor Grandstaff through his biomaterial class. Although I didn't get a chance to work with him directly, he is still very generous with his help. He guided me and provided me with resources. There is no doubt that Dr. Grandstaff is uh, incredibly successful in his career, but he is also very experienced uh, to mentor undergrad students and graduate students in their academic careers. If you have a chance to come and study at BU BME program, I recommend you to take Professor Grandstaff's course and collaborate with him. I believe he will add tremendous value to you. So, Professor Grandstaff, could you give us a brief overview of your lab and then the, some of the projects you are currently doing? I'd be happy to. So, it's great that you're here today. We're in lovely Boston in <laughs> August, so the weather's a little bit warm. Um, but my lab is very much interested in problems, per se, mm -hmm. not particularly one area of science or engineering. And those problems or challenges come from myself, students, clinical collaborators. And we're very much interested in cancer, thinking about new ways to deliver chemotherapeutics to reduce um, side effects and to maximize efficacy. We're very much interested in fibrosis and fibrotic disease. We have a program there. One of the projects that's new in the lab is in fibrosis. So I'm very mm. much interested in kind of stiff joints. I see. Um, and um, poor movement of joints. So I think that's an area that's very interesting. How did you, what made you interested in that fibrosis problem? Uh, that's a, an amazing story. So, um, so we have a clinical collaborator uh -huh. uh, named K-Rod. That's his short name, he's Ken Rodriguez. And he's a trauma surgeon over at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. And there were a number of young women who came in who had uh, broken elbows. Mm. So he fixed the bone, secured it, but all those women had restricted motion mm -hmm. in their elbow. Mm -hmm. They came back after a few years and sure enough, they still had restricted motion. I see. And then they came back a couple years later and a cohort of these women all had full range of motion. What changed? So exactly, what changed? And so we asked them, did they go to phys uh, physical training? Did they get surgery, taking medicine? Nothing. The only thing they had in common mm -hmm. was that they all had given birth and had successful pregnancies. 
And so we started thinking about, is there something during pregnancy? Yeah, hormones. Uh, hormones yeah. that might influence this. Yeah. So there's a hormone called relaxin, relaxin. that's okay. produced just before childbirth, and it okay. relaxes the cervix so the child can come out. Yeah, yeah. Biochemically, what it does is it upregulates matrix metalloproteases, which will degrade tissue, okay. and downregulates collagen production oh. to make the tissue weaker. So what we thought would be really exciting is if we had a frozen shoulder, mm -hmm. and in a frozen shoulder in that joint, there is fibrotic tissue buildup, and that's why the joint doesn't move. Mm -hmm. And our thought was if we injected relaxant into that joint, would it dissolve that fibrotic tissue yeah. and allow movement? Yeah. And so that's what we did. It was cool. So we figured out how to make the protein, a hormone. Yeah. We figured out how to build the right experimental models, so an animal model and a cell culture model. And then we did the real experiments, uh -huh. and it actually worked. It I was really exciting. But OK, problem come back. Is it no. a one-time solution? It's a one-time solution. And so anytime you have a stiff joint from a surgery, okay. or if you've been in a cast for a while and your legs are stiff, yeah. uh, I think this type of you therapy will help. Need. Oh, wow. So okay. it's a great story. It is. Fascinating. OK. Program there, as well as a program in diagnostics. Um, and how can we very quickly and quantitatively detect a particular biomarker, be it for cancer or be it for COVID, for hmm. example? And how do we do that in a way that's... You mentioned the COVID. Do we have like uh, one to two applications uh, related to COVID-19, the pandemic? Yes, I have two projects. Uh, one is in the area of diagnostics, and can we develop a method, for example, to uh, detect the whole virus itself as opposed to maybe the protein or the nucleic acid that's present there. So mm -hmm. that's quite exciting. We have a second project in thinking about new ways of developing vaccines and delivering a vaccine to the actual virus target. Both of those projects are very new in the lab, and they really sprung out of this pandemic uh, that we're in. And so it's important to give everybody around the table thinking about this problem and trying to come up with some unique solutions. Totally. OK. So what is the trend or the most popular research direction in your know, domain? And then what is the bottleneck? And then what's the most urgent problem people are trying to solve, like in your opinion, and then what the community thinks in general? I think one of the biggest opportunities is in the area of personalized medicine. And that's both on the diagnostic front and the treatment front. How do we develop tools and diagnostics so we can better understand the clinical problem? And if we have that information, how do we then develop therapies, be it a pharmacological intervention or be a medical device that has a better outcome? And I think it's really that um, ground between diagnostics and treatment that is so important to do. Um, within my own group, uh, we're very much interested in thinking about both new diagnostics as well as kind of new therapies. Okay. Can you give us some examples of like the new diagnosis or new therapies? Yeah. So one area we're interested in is uh, progesterone and fertility. Mm -hmm. And so if you can measure progesterone quickly and quantitatively, that would be really helpful. And so we have a, a project where we're using transcription factors as the sensing elements to be able to detect progesterone. And so that's a very unique way of doing it. And it's something that we're building on and moving forward with. I see, that's pretty cool. And uh, what some inventions or applications you envision will be developed in the future? Oh, I, I think there is so much opportunity out there, both on treatments as well as on devices. Um, we do a very poor job um, in diagnostics, for example. You know, how many biomarkers do we actually measure um, and how many of those are really important? And how often do we do a measurement? We have, you know, an Apple Watch uh, that can tell us our heart rate, but that's about all. And wouldn't it be a lot greater to understand everything that's going on in biology and can it be data driven, for example? I think on the treatment side, how do we think about making drugs uh, be more effective with fewer side effects? How do we get the drug to the target or to the site that it needs to be and do that in the most efficient and effective mm -hmm. way? Mm -hmm. All right.
like what challenges did you encounter as a faculty and how did you overcome them? I think one of the biggest challenges um, becoming a new faculty member is, is kind of threefold.